Back in the 70s, a man named Dr. William Shockley, a noted scientist, embarked upon the mission of proving to the world that black people are genetically inferior, without, I might add, the benefit of any formal background in genetics. He became front page news and won headlines with his controversial views. On campus after campus, unrest followed his every visit. My position then and now is that if a supremacist cannot be rationally debated, perhaps he has a point. After the debate you're now going to see, Dr. Shockley went back into oblivion. I don't claim that the 1973 interview did it alone, but I am of the opinion that it helped. I'm Tony Brown. In a moment, racial superiority with Dr. William Shockley. We have two very prominent educators, scholars on Black Journal tonight, and we feel that it is important to defend the First Amendment rights of all Americans. Dr. William Shockley, one of our guests, has had quite a difficult time speaking at some universities, and particularly some black college students do not agree with his theories. On Black Journal, we feel that Dr. Shockley's rights in the First Amendment area are parallel to black people's rights. That is, that Dr. Shockley must have a platform for his views if black people are to have a platform for their views. Dr. Francis Welsing, on the other side, has difficulty in expressing her views on legitimate mass media outlets because many whites do not agree with her theory of genetics. Now let's find out what the controversy is about. Dr. Shockley, please give us the benefit, basically, of what your theory is. My uh, principal point, uh, Mr. Brown, is uh, not so much a theory of black-white differences, but is summed up in one word, which is the theme of my appearance on your program and my efforts, and the word is dysgenics. And dysgenics means effectively downbreeding, retrogressive evolution. And I fear that this is worst for the black community, and I particularly welcome an opportunity to appear on Black Journal just for these reasons. And let me say also that when I first met Dr. Welsing, it was not black students who were disrupting, but white students. And Dr. Welsing made a very sincere and I thought extremely effective effort, a well-planned effort. It was not effective with these white students at Staten Island Community College, so I would have a chance to speak. In fact, I think they prevented her from saying what she wanted to say when she was trying to uh, gain me a platform. So my main theme is that we have problems that we should face and we should look at connected with dysgenics. And I welcome any opportunity I have to bring this out so that people can look at it and worry about it. Dr. Shockley, you are accused of having a theory uh, that is uh, a racist, a white racist theory. How do you respond to that? Well, I respond to that by saying that I've considered whether or not I am a racist. Racist is an epithet that used to damage my self-esteem, but it doesn't anymore. I feel it's untrue. If you look in the dictionary as to what racist means, it means uh, emotional feelings, irrational feelings associated with fear and hate. If I really had those, I don't think I would be here this evening. I feel that uh, what I'm engaged in is a demand for diagnosis. And I'd like to say some more about this chart, which we'll, we'll come to probably later, which shows the disproportionate rates of reproduction for the least effective elements of the black community. I'd like to say more about that than we should in just this brief introduction. But uh, I think there is another word that better describes what I'm involved in, and that word is raceology, which means a scientific analysis of racial differences. And I, uh, basically, I have a faith that reason is a good thing, and I feel, uh, as you do about the First Amendment, but maybe with a slightly different emphasis. I think the really important thing about the First Amendment is it is a way of guaranteeing a high likelihood that truth will emerge as a result of conflict, conflicting ideas being expressed. And I have a thesis and a basic belief that truth is a good thing and will be of benefit to man. Thank you. Dr. Francis Welsing, give us the benefit of your theory, please. Well, my theory was, I wrote the paper in 1969. I wrote a paper called The Crest Theory of Color Confrontation and Racism. And the sole reason behind writing that paper was an attempt to understand the behavior of white people in relationship to all people of color every place in the world black brown red and yellow people and the paper was presented to the americans at the national medical association the section on psychiatry in neurology because back in 1969 uh, the black 
caucus in the American Psychiatric Association, we had said that racism, and when we talk about racism, we're talking about the white supremacy behavior of white people that racism was the number one mental health problem in the nation and it was the number one cause of other mental health problems. And I wanted to understand what this thing of racism really is all about because it's the kind of, it is the thing that has caused woe and misery and suffering for the vast majority of the people on this planet that are classified as non-white. And in my attempt to understand why the necessity of white people to keep saying that white is superior and that the condition of non-white is inferior. And the more I thought about it, in conjunction with uh, an idea that a friend of mine had that racism was a worldwide behavioral system for the maintenance of white supremacy by a small minority of people. I put those ideas together with what we know about genetics, what we know about the condition of skin whiteness itself. The condition of skin whiteness is the genetic inability to produce skin pigment called melanin. This is a genetic recessive trait. It is a genetic deficiency state, not as defined by Francis Welsing, but defined by geneticists and dermatologists that the inability to produce the skin pigment of melanin or melanin pigment is described as albinism. And I think that white people even though most white people are not consciously understanding their problem in genetics. They are certainly aware that they are genetically dominated by people of color. That's why it was a statement, one, block, one drop of black blood makes you black, because people of color have the genetic capacity to annihilate white people. And so unless white people control the reproductivity of people of color, then we have, we can postulate that perhaps one day there won't be any white people. And I think that the very survival of white people necessitates that they project genetic inferiority on people of color because it is they who really are aware that they are genetic recessive and perhaps genetically inferior to people of color. And I am not saying this to to call uh, the condition of skin whiteness to say, well, no, white people are inferior. I'm not saying it for that purpose, but I think that it is of prime importance for the majority of people in the world to understand why it is that white people have to, the effective majority, large numbers of white people, have to move in a hostile and an aggressive way against people of color and have to constantly focus on, it's you who's genetically inferior because they realize that there's something wrong with their genetic status. Now, now. May I what? take a call? Oh, sure, All right. please. Let, let me, uh, so that, because uh, we have a number of calls, and we'll see what the public wants to find That's out cool. also. Just one second. Hello, go ahead, please. You're on Black Journal. Yes, thank you. I would, I would like to ask the question, why does the doctor feel that his theory, Dr. Shockley, why does, why does you feel that your theory is correct? Well, let me say that's a, um, a long question. Let me point out one aspect. Uh, I mean, it's a, a question that calls for a very long answer. Uh, I think I might just at this point say that in a time like one hour, we may expose a problem and encourage thinking about it, and this is a very valuable thing. But to uh, cover either Dr. Welsing's views or mine, and let me say here are just to show that these things exist, is a pamphlet that she was good enough to give me some time ago. Uh, they this one's upside down. Well, that one's upside down. Yeah, Thank you. Right. <laughs> um, and this is uh, one of my own. It's actually a collection of a, de of a debate. The imperative of ethnic education is yours. Uh, this is the issue of the journal. Mine was, uh, the title of my uh, paper is somewhat different from this, but I want to say uh, that speaking for myself, if people would like to write to me at Stanford University, I have a post box there, post box S, which is the same as Shockley and Stanford. I will try to supply more information, and I'm sure Dr. Welsing will say what she can do about making, uh, telling people how to reach her pamphlet. Okay. But now let me say this chart that I held up a moment ago is very important in respect to this question of why I think uh, there may be what proves a basic difference. But I'm going to say that if there were not a basic difference and uh, intellectual capacity in the past, there probably will be a basic difference between black and white intellectual capacity in the future simply because of the reproduction patterns. And these are Census Bureau data, and this is the most threatening aspect. And what it indicates is that for the black women of the lowest intellectual social class, 
um, which are rural farm women, generally the education is least, the average number of children is 5.4. For women with um, <coughs> college degrees, it's 1.9. And um, so this is definitely unfavorable. It is, it is reproducing far more at the bottom end and not enough to keep even at the top end. Dr. Shockley, can For you whites, uh, let me just finish uh -huh. this. For whites, the numbers are also in this direction, but nowhere nearly as, uh, as severe. Dr. Shockley, I think that uh, in all fairness, you should explain to the audience why it is that you have, first of all, you have a very large segment of the black population who are uh, on farms, who are deprived in cities. Why don't you explain at the time that you're showing this, why, who is keeping black people in a situation like they're in? I mean, it could be, you could turn it around the other way where you could have very large numbers of black people who are exposed to educational opportunities like white people who are exposed to housing, who are exposed, exposed to health facilities. Why don't you explain that at the same time that you put well, figures I'm, like I'm that? Sure, you would explain it, uh, no, but Dr. I think Welsing. It's important but in uh, answering one must say first fine. things first. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, you've raised the basic question there, and that is whether the disadvantages are primarily a lack of opportunity or whether they are primarily a basic genetic difference. And let me mention one thing, which is that in certain areas there is no doubt about black superiority. Blacks are superior in visual acuity. Which is that in certain areas there is no doubt about black superiority. Blacks are superior in visual acuity. Which is that in certain areas there is no doubt about black superiority. Blacks are superior in visual acuity. Which is that in certain areas there is no doubt about black superiority. Blacks are superior in visual acuity, and they're superior in a systematic way. Now, I, uh, I don't expect that people will understand the details of this, but I simply want to show that quantitative work can be done. This happens to be a research job of my own. And what it shows, because these points that you see here lie on a, on a line, which is not the, the central line, but they lie systematically on a line, what it says is that so far as visual acuity is concerned, Blacks are systematically better than whites. It's as if their bell-shaped curve, their distribution curve, were pushed upwards compared to whites for visual acuity, or at least for the avoidance of bad eyesight, such that if the same shift occurred for IQ, it would mean that the average IQ distribution would be up by nine points rather than down by about 15 points, which is the typical average. Dr. Shockley, visual acuity is probably something that the system of white supremacy has not necessarily seen the need to affect the environment that black people are in so that it will alter the fact that they have visual acuity that is superior to whites. The fact of visual acuity is not attacked in the same way as educational opportunity and job performance is attacked. And I think but that this it's, is... It's evidence for a genetic difference, in Well, my you see opinion. what I'm saying? There might be many, many more genetic right. differences where people of color Fine. appear superior. Yeah. If I may, we have a number of people, and we'd like to get to as many as possible. If you could make your answers, as, not to compromise your explanation, <laughs> right. but if you could make your answers as succinct, I would appreciate it, because we'd like to okay. involve the public as much as we can. One moment, please. Your unbacked journal. Go ahead, please. I was wondering if Dr. Shockley could explain the basic difference between his, the course he is taking in explaining white supremacy and the course that Hitler took in, in, uh, during the Nazism reign. Thank you. Well, there are enormous differences. In fact, uh, the lesson to be learned from Nazi history is frequently very misunderstood. And it is a lesson which Mr. Brown has told us about earlier. It's the First Amendment. It's not that eugenics is intolerable. Actually, the eugenic programs, which are the opposite of dysgenics, uh, eugenic programs uh, are not inconceivable. They're not inhumane. Denmark has been carrying out programs with strong eugenic implications for maybe 30 years. And it's important to note that since World War II, Denmark's per capita homicide rate dropped and is now approximately 1 20th. That is, the number of deaths of probability of being killed in a year by, uh, by a violent homicide is roughly, oh, the order of 100 times less for young Danes than it is for young American blacks. Can I? Now, the, uh, uh, but the lesson, let me say, what uh, the, the lesson of Nazi history we have in this country, and it will protect us. It's just the thing that makes this program possible. 
the First Amendment, which allows freedom of speech. If one believes that is not the right answer, then one has to be one of the most anti-German racists that can be. If one believes that the German people would have tolerated the concentration camps and the gas chambers, if news media, like uh, the programs that Mr. Brown is setting on, if those people were willing to bring uh, discordant views out into the open, I don't believe the concentration camps and the gas chambers could have continued to exist in Germany. I'd like to comment because I'd like to say that I don't think that there's a major difference between what Dr. Shockley is doing. I don't think that Dr. Shockley is fully aware of what he is doing and why he is doing what he's doing. But the long-range implications of what he is doing are no different than the propaganda campaign that Hitler and his Nazi unit carried on in Germany that ended up eliminating uh, six million Jewish people. Now what is most interesting is that Hitler said the very same thing. He said, number one, that the Jews were genetically inferior to the Aryans. Number two, he was aware that the Semites had genetically dominant material uh, genetic material to the Aryans. And if we begin to understand the way that people who were in Europe at the time that the Semites arrived from Africa, when the Semites arrived in Europe from Africa, they were people who had substantial amounts of color and who had very kinky hair because they were from the continent of Africa. And the Europeans, the white people who were there, had a reaction, a color reaction to the Semites that is no different than the reaction and the concern on the part of people who are white in this area of the world or any other area of the world to people who, are, who have the genetic capacity to produce color, who can genetically annihilate their position. And I think it's very, very important, even though Dr. Shockley, I am convinced that Dr. Shockley believes that he is uh, perhaps elevating science with all of his charts and all of his figures, but he doesn't understand the things that propel him as a white individual in a social system that has programmed him throughout his life and programmed large numbers of people like him to focus on the genetics of people of color in such a way as to destroy people of color. I would like to ask a question and Dr. Shockley, if you could answer it, uh, yes or no, I would appreciate it. Do you believe that black people are inferior in intelligence because of their heredity? I have a standard statement. It is not yes or no. It's memorized. I say at the same time every, every time, I think. What I say is this. My research leads me, and it's a tragic conclusion, really. Uh, my research leads me inescapably to the opinion that the major cause of the American Negro's intellectual and social deficits is hereditary and racially genetic in origin, and thus not remediable to a major degree by practical improvements in environment. All right. If you believe that uh, the position relatively of black Americans to white Americans is based on a genetic inferiority, and I will, I will accept the responsibility for that word, uh, then what do you see as the solution to the problem? Well, I see the first uh, aspect of this is to prevent the problem from becoming worse by dysgenics. This first word that Would you I, uh, that translate I dysgenics what, what for I'm, me and the audience? Uh, what Would I that be sterilization? Is, no. Dysgenics, you see, means what that other chart I showed you says. Should blacks, the least effective element. Should blacks be sterilized? Uh, no. I have a... Uh, this but if then blacks gets are a problem and we, and we do not allow... This is inhumane. And Dr. I think Shockley one can find more humane solutions to, to this. Well, then, then how would, then, then, I would propose something in which one of the key clauses, phrases, is regardless of sex, race, or welfare status. And this is the proposal. I call it a thinking exercise. It's mentioned in that pamphlet that I showed that you can obtain. Um, and it goes this way, that you would offer a bonus to everyone to be sterilized. Now, we know we have a population explosion problem. We know that in India that bonuses in the form of transistor radios would are this offered bonus to people. Be, or, would this bonus be directed to black people specifically, more Mr. than white? Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, what did I say just a moment ago? I said, regardless of sex, race, or welfare status. Now, there is a group, Not to there is a uh, group, that's of, what I say, uh, there is a group of white people to whom this offer this, should be made also. Absolutely. Now, now the, offer will the, the, offer is based, the offer is based upon the best estimates, best scientific estimates that one can have of any genetically carried disabilities. Now, there are some, I think, that any humane person would have no doubt about. And uh, Dr. Welsing talked about dominant and recessive genes. I want to point out that sometimes a dominant gene can be a very bad thing, and it is a very bad thing for color. a neurological disease called 
Huntington's chorea, which is something which like is multiple sclerosis. Which is more prominent in white people than black people. That is correct. And mm -hmm. I think that one should offer a large bonus for anyone who might be Dr. potentially Shockley. carrying Huntington's chorea. Dr. Shockley, Beyond are this, you aware? it goes on with some other factors in this, but Dr. Welsing wishes are you, to speak. Are you aware that white people have more genetic diseases that affect their nervous system than people of color than black people? Are you aware that white people have more genetic diseases that affect their nervous system than people of color than black people. Are you aware that white people have more genetic diseases that affect their nervous system than people of color than black people? Are you aware that white people have more genetic diseases that affect their nervous system than people of color than black people? Are you aware that white people have more genetic diseases that affect their nervous system than people of color than black people? That affect their nervous system than people of color than black people? I wouldn't be at all surprised. And I think now, blacks would you have, suggest, uh, would you have suggest higher heart that problems. all of these, would you suggest that all of these white people who are carrying these defective genes you know, whose families may carry these defective genes, that they be examined and su it would be suggested to them that they be sterilized. Would you suggest this? Yes, I think I would, probably, in general. Go ahead, you're on Black Journal, please. What we know about ancient black civilizations, how can American blacks suddenly be genetically regressive? Thank you. Let me, let me just say this. What is very interesting is um, in the study of biology, uh, biologists who have studied evolution, one of the very interesting things that they say is that the more functional skin pigment cells in the animal kingdom, the higher you are on the scale of phylogenetic ascension. In other words, nature in the course of evolution went to its highest state when it produced a cell that could produce pigment and that we were sliding backwards. The mutation to albinism is a step backwards in the, in the scale of evolution. Are you aware of that, Dr. Shockley? No, I'm not aware of that uh, particular one. I am aware of another basic genetic difference, and that is that the rate of maturation of a neurological system gets uh, longer and longer the more advanced the animal is. And there is, that is one of the items on the racial difference, that the neurological development of blacks is faster than whites. Black ba babies walk on the average a month earlier than white babies. And the period and of black uh, gestation... And black people are much more creative also than uh, white Dr. Wells, uh, Shockley, correct me uh, if I'm incorrect. Uh, didn't the Giselle schedule, which tested the intelligence of children, make a correlative, a correlative between intelligence and walking early? Yes. And I would think it probably would have been negative. No, no, it, no, it was positive. not. It was positive. Well, the uh, there were the have... motor skills on the Giselle schedule indicated that earlier precocious walking children. There was a correlation between that and high intelligence. This may be true. Uh, it might be true within a group. I'm not sure of that. Well, maybe I, that, I know that yeah. there is a correlation in terms of. Uh, things earlier than walking in this at the six month stage uh, Nancy Bailey at Berkeley has established that uh, white children who come from the most advanced families and who later when they become older are out at the top at the first six months they are relatively retarded compared to children who are uh, from families uh, right. of less accomplishment and who don't go as far but this uh, so there are a, a number of these things certainly to be brought in Fine. but this uh, this uh, Giselle this, schedule is a very authentic accepted institutional uh, psychological and experiment. so is the Nancy Bailey <laughs> early uh, test. I'd like to take another okay, call. Okay. You're on Black Journal. Go ahead, please. Hello. Uh, this question is addressed to Dr. Welsing. First, I would like to say that Mr. Brown and Dr. Welsing disprove immediately Dr. Shockley's concept because here we have two highly intelligent, gifted people. And but getting this out of the way, Dr. Welsing, <laughs> wouldn't you agree that there is a strong genetic component to the inheritance of intelligence. Geneticists believe that 80% component is hereditary. Let me finish Dr. Welsing. And then also, I think the association of skin color with, in with intelligence is an erroneous concept. And I want your views on this. Isn't it true that the historic fate of black people, the, the, the uh, tragic deprivation, the conditions under which they were raised, any people raised under these conditions would have an hereditary evolutionary background which could lead to uh, poor capacity to generalize, to uh, conceptualize, to create, to be creative in the form field of ideas and develop other excellent attributes. Now this is 
not a racist idea. This could happen to any group who has a tragic history of the black people. Thank you. Uh, no, I do not feel that uh, there's any evidence to suggest that 80% of the ability to come to terms with your environment, that, ha that has to do with heredity. I think that much of it has to do with the environmental opportunity that the genetic material is exposed to. Uh, I think that if we look at the black people, if we just take uh, the black group, and we look at those people who have been able to achieve and we look at their backgrounds, we will find that they have had substantial social and economic opportunities that maybe some of the segment of the black population has not had. We will find the same thing in the white group. Those white people who have been socioeconomically deprived and at the bottom of the economic scale for whites, that these people are not performing in the same way that people who have extended socioeconomic opportunity. One of the very interesting things is that white women are now talking about women's liberation and they are looking at their performance relative to white men and they are they are saying and all of the spokesmen for white women and men and women are also saying that the reason that the white woman has less confidence in her performance and is not performing as well relatively speaking as a white male has been the attitudes within the white family as to the role of the woman versus the role of the man now what is interesting is that when white people are looking at the difference in the performance of the, black, of the white woman and the white man on IQ tests, they can account for that on the basis of environmental influences. However, when they shift over into looking at whites relative to people of color, somehow they want to drop that understanding and that awareness. Uh, it's been interesting, uh, to say the least. Uh, I'm happy you had your say, Dr. Shockley and Dr. Welsing. I'm happy you had yours, and thank you for being on Black Journal. ...of black people. Today, another bombshell suggests empirical evidence of black biological inferiority, The Bell Curve. A book by Charles Murray and the late Richard Herrnstein cited statistics alleging that blacks on average score 15 points below whites on IQ tests. They compared averages, not individuals, the authors asserted. True, because some of the highest test scores ever registered on IQ tests were made by blacks. However, the author's premise reinforces the racialist eugenics theory of African inferiority. We invited Charles Murray to present his views on this program. He refused. But joining me to examine this issue is the woman who took on Dr. Shockley and his views on Aryan superiority. I'm Tony Brown. We'll be back with Race and Intelligence. My guest is Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, a psychiatrist and author of ISIS papers, the keys to the colors. Dr. Welsing, welcome back to our series. After 20 years, I'd like to say that uh, Dr. Shockley's premise is as vivid today and as alive as it was when we did that program in 1973. Precisely. And his premise sounds, uh, to, seems to be the, the, the father of Charles Murray's uh, the, the, the bell curve. Do you agree with that? Well, I wouldn't say that it was a father. It's in the continuing wake of the discussion, the historic discussion of black genetic inferiority. I mean, uh, a couple of years ago, we were being bombarded with uh, violence in the black community is related to black people's genetics, but not anybody else's violence being related to their genetics. And so now Charles Murray is coming out in Richard Herrenstein that black genetic inferiority. And as a matter of fact, Tony, I'm very happy about it. The reason being is that 24 years ago, in my paper, The Crest Theory of Color Confrontation and Racism, White Supremacy, I said that the population that classifies itself as white has to continue to focus on color, genetics, sex, and numbers. And so 24 years after having made that statement, here we go again. So I'm not uh, at all surprised, and I'm glad to have the Crest Theory again validated. Now, in, uh, in both Dr. Shockley's uh, conclusion and in the Bell Curve's conclusion is the uh, conclusion that uh, blacks are uneducable and that public policy needs to be shaped to understand, to conform with the, quote, fact that no amount of money 
is going to rehabilitate or habilitate, whichever you choose, black exactly. people in this country. Exactly. What are the implications? Well, I think, again, the implications, first of all, we need to understand that this discussion doesn't occur in the vacuum. It occurs within what I call a global, national, local system of white supremacy. Now, what do I mean by that? I maintain and have for the past quarter century that the behavior that we see, including this focusing, comes about because the white population on the planet is a tiny minority population. It's not people of color who are the minorities. Whites are fewer than one-tenth of the population on the planet. Number two, and perhaps most importantly, white. You see, when white people say, I am white, they are talking genetically about a genetic recessive characteristic that is a variant of albinism, not defined by Francis Welsing. Now that genetic recessive characteristic plus the minority status means that the white population can conceivably be genetically annihilated by genetically dominant black, brown, red, and yellow people in terms of skin coloration. So my thesis in the Crest Theory was that all of the behavior, you see the repression of blacks, the attack on black males in particular, the lynching, the castration, the obsession with saying something is wrong with your genetics because at a subconscious level, whites are aware we are the population on the planet that is genetically vulnerable. Now, let, let me give you one exception that I know of, and that is Brazil. Uh, during slavery in Brazil, racism as a premise for slavery was as uncommon as s s racism was a premise for slavery in the United States. And in a, in a Brazil, the white population is diminishing, and the black population is diminishing, and the population in the middle, which is a miscegenated population, is the one that's growing. So uh, I think there... Well, but see, I would say, Tony, that still, if now, you now, go... Finish one point. Well, I'm sorry. I just, and my point, I, I'm not trying to cut you off, mm -hmm. but I think my point is, I don't want to sound too abstract, my point mm -hmm. is that in some parts of the world, whites don't seem to be as fearful of what you call, refer to as annihilation, perhaps, as in the United States? Well, I would still say if one goes to Brazil, and if you go and see who controls the banking centers, it will be a population of people that say, oh, we the, are the, white. That's, 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 you see, yeah, and right. at the same time, if you go to yeah. the favelas and into the slums, yeah. Do you see, you see the darkest and the blackest population. And, the only, and, and you're right, and the only thing I'm saying is that that population, and that population culturally, is very different from the United States. And, and, and racism wasn't the premise for slavery there, but it was the premise for slavery in the United States. Well, you see, I say that there, in other words, there are various, there are variations on the theme. Mm -hmm. There's variation in terms of the particular language that the discussion is carried out in. But you never get away from, if you're black, stay back, brown, stick around, yellow, mellow, white, right, you mm -hmm. see. And the more color you have to cause white genetic annihilation, then the more pressure that is put on you. So this hierarchy of color, whether you're in Asia, whether you're in Africa, whether you're in Latin America, Central America, this still obtains, but I don't want us to get lost. No, okay, I, I don't, I, but I do want right. to get back to a, a, a primary point here, because I think we've, we've jumped over it, right. and that is the bell curve, and let me just say this, it's not just the bell curve. The week that the bell curve came out, two other books came out on the same subject, mm -hmm. and they've had so much success. The cover of Time Magazine, Newsweek, U.S. News World Report had a feature story, New York Times, two weeks in a row, yes. very prominent play. The media just grabbed onto this idea. Now, with this happening, gonna, there's going to be a plethora of books on this very, very subject. Precisely. Now, in this new wave, unlike Shockley and Jensen, to a lesser extent, the focus is on quote, data, meaning that someone is empirically saying that they can demonstrate that there is biological inferiority among blacks, and that it, it turns on one statistic, and that one statistic is that blacks make, an, on average, and they were careful to say not individuals but average, because it never could have gotten off the ground with individuals, because too many black individuals uh, are, are exceptions to, the, mm -hmm. to this rule, but on average, blacks make 15 points less than whites. Now, what is your direct refutation of that alleged empirical evidence? 
Well, do you see, I would say this, that first of all, I'm a psychiatrist, a general psychiatrist, child psychiatrist. We've always looked at IQ tests as being very directly related to the environment. Now, if someone doesn't want to closely examine the environment, all of the dimensions of the environment, then someone could easily say, well, it's not the environment that makes the difference. Do you see, I maintain that it is the environment that makes the difference and on Sunday, the uh, recently, an uh, article was in one of the major newspapers in Washington, D.C., where a young white male, senior at the uh, University of Maryland, had his skin darkened, and he went to the South. He could have stayed in Maryland, but he went to the South. He was going to be black because he did not believe when blacks would say, it's racism, it's racism. He thought that that was really just an excuse. So he had his skin darkened by a dermatologist, and he went to the South, and he could only tolerate the oppression for two days before he came running home and crying to his mother, I can't deal with it, no, I no. can't deal with it. Now what I'm saying mm -hmm. is that here is someone who can, you know, the chemical is not given, and so he turns back white. He knew he had that escape, but he still, he couldn't tolerate the insults in the restaurant, the, the various day-to-day, -day, 24 hours a day, seven day a week, assaults that a person of psyche. color on his psyche that the person experiences. Not physically. Not physically. But psychologically. You see, but it's not generally talked about. Mm -hmm. You see, in other words, he talked about such things as being ignored when he would go into a restaurant, do you see, or someone saying uh, niggers are, you know, no good. Mm -hmm. Just on and on and on and on now, that's continuous. One that, that overt racism, overt Well, I won't even call it overt. Oh, okay, but I might call, do you see, uh, shooting or lynching overt, but mm -hmm. I'm talking about the very subtle things. All right, all right. I, I, and you're right. What I would like to do, however, is to identify some other environmental factors that would contribute to this 15-point gap. You've identified one, okay. uh, the, the subtle uh, erosion of, of self-esteem, uh, the, 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 the subtle psychological implantation of uh, the feeling of inferiority, which must manifest itself somewhere under some circumstance. But apart from that, what are some of the other environmental factors that well, you can identify? Well, if we understand racism is a system that is operative in all areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. And so this barrage, full court press, is coming at you on a daily basis. If it impacts economics and labor, this means, as is the case in large numbers of black families, you're talking about a one-parent family as opposed to a two-parent family. You're talking about disparage in, uh, uh, inadequacies or inequities in terms of wages. And all of this begins to impact on what it is that is happening in that critical unit that we call the family unit. And if that unit cannot function in a supportive manner, for example, black infants, when they are born, in the first nine months of life are accelerated compared to white infants. Now, how are they accelerated? How well, do you they're mean that? accelerated in terms of such things as smiling, holding up their heads, recognition, motor of faces, and motor activity. Do you see? And smiling is also intellectual activity. But with the assault of this environment in a highly structured environment that I say is structured for the purpose of white genetic survival. Uh, do, do you see that yeah, yeah. this begins to then take its toll? It's as though you have two races, two people running a race. Mm -hmm. One, you tie weights around their ankles, and everything else is equal, but one has weights tied around his or her ankles. I've seen a number of studies, and frequently they, they seem to cluster around something happening to a black child around seven years of age. Have you, have you identified that age at all? Well, I see it everywhere. Around seven, something happens to the black child. They grow tremendously up to that point, and then all of a sudden there's a, there's a fall. Well, you see, the child has entered school at that point, 
And upon entering school, I mean, try to think about, when I think about what first grade was like, mm -hmm. do you see, it was mm -hmm. Dick and Jane and Spot and Puff, mm -hmm. and a white family. Mm -hmm. It wasn't anything about a black family. It was a white family, all the pictures were white, all the presidents were white, everybody that you focused on that was doing anything, Goldilocks, Snow White, everybody is white, including a white Christmas, a white bunny rabbit. Do you see, so that the child be, is taking all of this information in about the environment and how he or she is valued or looked upon in the environment. Just learning the English language. You learn that white is pure and black is evil, black is bad. If the stock market falls, it's a black Tuesday or a black Monday. Right, the bottom line, does a 15-point disparity on IQ exams make blacks genetically inferior? Well, I would say absolutely no. Do you see, if we want to get down to genetics. White is a genetic mutation from black. It is albinism. The earliest people, the first people on the planet were black people. And black people produced albinos. If you mix the two together, you get the whole human family. So I say, no, it doesn't mean that. But I want to move. Let's assume for the purpose of argument that let's say black people are 50 points below white people. Do you see, according to their tests, the bottom line is, okay, Dr. Murray, Dr. Jensen, Dr. Shockley, Dr. Herrenstein, what is it that you intend to do about this? Do you see? Are you saying, therefore, your model is Adolf Hitler and company? So we have decided that you are inferior. The bottom line is, what are you going to do about it? because there are many children, white, black, brown, red, or yellow, who are damaged genetically, congenitally, we say they're mentally retarded. Now we have special schools, we do everything to help these children, we put them in small classes, we give them three or four teachers, we give them all kinds of things to try to exploit the genetic potential. But now somebody comes along and says a 15 point difference means we cannot expect anything from these people. Well, if we cannot expect anything and the global economy is declining, well, gosh, we're back with Adolf. Do you see? Well, we just cannot tolerate this debris in our population. If I may, the, in, and I want you to continue your point. I don't want to interrupt. I do want to say this. I read an editorial recently on, uh, on, the, on the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal, not a newspaper to take lightly. And the, 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 the writer was very favorable, anti the, the bell curve. This was not a racist writing an article. It was a very, very objective, fair uh, editorial. And he mentioned the eugenics movement mm -hmm. that the Chinese are involved in, in terms of in China, of culling out the bottom and, and reproducing the top. And he concluded that if the liberals kept on making more out of the bell curve than it is, we may see, quote, a Beijing solution in the United States. Well, let's States. not go to a Beijing solution where we have a Nazi Germany solution. Do you understand where mm -hmm. it wasn't just a population? I mean, there have been many populations if a child is born defective. Do you see? They do not allow that child to go on and exist. That's, That's quite different. Mm -hmm. That's um, quite different than saying there are populations of people. Genocide. Do you see that are superfluous and that are a contaminant and we need to be pure and clean so that we can really arrive where we're supposed to arrive. We're back in Nazi Germany. So I say that first of all, we have to recognize Nazi Germany was about white supremacy. It was about white, the white genetic population feeling that it was vulnerable to an assault by people whose real genetic origin began in North Africa. You see, their religion was not the critical issue. The issue was that they had their origins in a population that was classified as non-white. And so I say that we need to not debate numbers because God forbid, but Dr. Murray or his grandchildren might come out with an IQ difference 15 points lower than his. My next question will operate on the premise uh, that your statement there is, 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 is uh, objective. Therefore, I will go to the next point. If what you're saying is true, are blacks doing anything 
to accelerate a process toward a quote final solution? Well, Blacks themselves? No. Do you see the people of color on the planet who are being approached by people who have all these genetic issues in their minds and they don't understand, they don't understand that white supremacy mindset or the mindset that is feeling vulnerable to white genetic annihilation so you have a big population conference in Cairo. To the extent that people of color on the planet do not understand this mindset, it's like being at the chessboard and not understanding the game with all of the people of color on the planet on the black side of the chessboard and you have white supremacy or the dynamic for white genetic survival moving against this group of people. Now I believe instead of getting emotionally upset about Charles Murray's position or anybody who is in that group of thinkers, I believe again take out the Crest theory, see where all of this has been laid out before predicting how this mindset operates and begin to place oneself in a mode of understanding what the game is that is on the right, table. If, if I can summarize the game, the game is going to turn on public opinion. Hitler only did what he was able to do and he was only able to do certain things because he had organized German public opinion. What, if anything, are blacks or some blacks doing in terms of accelerating a negative public opinion or a public opinion oh, well, that could okay. come back to bite them? That's All my, right, well, that's let's, my let's take an example a person who considers him or herself to be an actor, television actor, black, who doesn't understand this white supremacy dynamic. So somebody comes along and offers them a job, you see, but they have to act as a clown and a buffoon, and they just think, well, I'm in the abstract being an actor or an actress. Unbeknownst to them, it's a whole context in which this role is being carried out, where people feel who have set up this image that they need to be in re reinforced. See, look at blacks. They're clowns. They're stupid. They're buffoons. Look at this. This is trash. Well, let's look at daytime television. Look at it for me, will you, with the eyes of a psychiatrist. All right, the daytime talk shows. Yes. All right, I would say that there are many black people that are being tapped. I don't know where they go to find these people. Do you see? But it's as if it's the parallel would be. If a white person who's putting on a television show decides, let me go and get the least advantaged white person and put them up on the television continually, not the most beautiful, the most articulate, the most intelligent. No, let me go to the poorest area where there are white people and then put them up continually as a model for what white people are all about. You see, we go back to Nazi Germany and Joseph Goebbels, who understood if we keep putting out negative images of Semites of the Jewish religion, we can train the population to say, look, they're animals. They're not human. And so the sooner we get rid of them, the better. I think that many talk shows are using and trashing black people in this manner, in addition to some of the shows that come on in the evening. I can think of uh, one of the shows that just trashes the image of black men. We complained in the 50s and the 60s and maybe the 40s about the Amos and Andy image. Those are angelic images <laughs> compared to the images of black men do you see that are being put on the television and this is supposed to be entertainment. I say no. This you know is what I, I thought was remarkable uh, and I've read it everywhere and that was the reaction of the vast majority of white people to the Clarence Thomas hearings. Not yay or nay Clarence or Anita Hill, but it was, I have never seen so many articulate, intelligent black people before. And well, it was that like, was because they had been indoctrinated with the idea. With, with the kind of uh, see, uh, images black you're talking genetic about. Inferiority. Yeah. And I would say to the white population, I would say this, that of the people on the planet, some of the people who walk around and have to hold their heads down who are white are people whose origin is German or white South African because they are known throughout the world to have brutalized people. You see, they're ashamed of themselves. And so I would say to white people, it's very important for them to look further than what somebody says is an objective IQ score and begin to hold the mirror up and do self-exam. <laughs> okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad to be with all of you and to have been invited to share with you at this very important conference. 
I want to apologize in person for not being able to be with you yesterday, but I was given a summons to be a member of the jury. I'd never had that happen before. And I called and asked, couldn't I be excused <laughs> as a physician? And they told me I better get down there. <laughs> so it was because I could not be excused that I could not attend yesterday. Oh. Well, my remarks are going to be in the framework of understanding that we are in a war. And I have come to give my comments and my understanding of what that war is really all about. But I think the first thing that is in order, I would like to ask all of these young men to stand up and for us to applaud them. Thank you. Because really, they are out on the front line, whether they understand it or not. They are out on the front line, and in many instances, we have failed to provide the defense for them and failed to provide the support to ensure that they will succeed. But we are here to talk about how we can better do that and how we can better understand what our task is and what our responsibility is in the 1990s as we enter the 21st century. Now, my remarks were to be the black male from endangerment to empowerment. And I have put my own little subtitle to that, from mass death, physical and psychological, to mass resurrection. Now, as a physician and as a psychiatric physician, my viewpoint is influenced by that medical background. And I'm a third generation physician in my family. My father was a physician. His father was a physician. And here I stand. And my grandfather, my grandmother always said, because my grandfather died in 1909, I never knew him. But my grandmother always said, your grandfather was a race man, meaning that the welfare of African people in America was something of the highest priority to him. And somehow that kind of magically passed down, or if not magically, predeterminedly passed down to me. But in that tradition, I understand that unless the physician can adequately diagnose the illness and have an analysis and an accurate, in-depth, appropriate analysis of the illness, that we cannot be successful in making certain that the patient lives. And so I see as our critical responsibility at this time, as we attempt to understand what exactly is this dynamic that is causing black male persons to be dying in unacceptable numbers and failing in unacceptable numbers, to be standing on corners in unacceptable numbers. So we have to understand exactly and specifically, not just to record those numbers, not to just moan and groan and bemoan those numbers. We have to understand exactly why those numbers are there so that we very specifically determine 
what are we going to do about it? What exactly are we going to do about it? Now, those of you who have heard me speak before know that since 1970, I have been making a statement about what I understand to be what is going on. And I have been saying to people that we as black people greet each other by saying what's happening. And I say we put that greeting in the form of a question because we don't really understand yet what's going on. And so after today, I hope that we will be greeting each other by saying, you do know what's happening, don't you? <laughs> you see in that a war is going on, and that we greet each other by saying the war continues, and that each and every one of us are going to continue to do our part in that war, to bring that war to a just end, and so that there can be peace on this planet. And the reason that I say there is a war, because bodies are falling. I'm from the District of Columbia, and we are already at one or more deaths every day of black men. We had 400 and 70 plus deaths at the end of last year in a city with fewer than one million people. And that's the District of Columbia alone. I think the national figures are something like 10,000 deaths in this area of the world of young black men each year. So what is going on? And as a psychiatric physician, there's a critical part of the psychiatric examination that we seek to determine, and we call it orientation. Is the person oriented as to time, place, and person? That means, does the person know where they are? Does the person know who they are? And does the person know what time it is? If the person is not oriented to time, to place, and to person, we write down major mental illness. If we do not understand that a war is going on of immense proportion, if we think it's fun and games, if we think we can proceed as business as usual, my answer is that we are not oriented and that it is a case of serious mental illness, meaning not able to face reality, and so therefore not being able to do anything about reality. It is as though a fire, if it were, tragically to break out in this auditorium, and I stood here and said, don't worry, everybody just be cool. It's roses blowing over there. You see, but if I misidentified reality, and if we all misidentified reality, we would all burn up tragically. So I say the same in terms of what is going on today. If we misidentify what is happening, we will be destroyed. So I want us to understand that reality so that we can do the appropriate thing. Now, 20 years ago, I presented the paper, The Crest Theory of Color Confrontation and Racism. And that paper grew out of my conviction that as I approached and talked to and sought to help black patients in a major psychiatric hospital, that everything that had caused them to be disoriented or to have problems with their behavior and their emotions and therefore their functioning had to do with racism. So I knew that I needed to understand racism beyond, well, that's just something that happens in the cause of economic activity and to produce profits. So that didn't seem to really make 
a lot of sense when you went to apply that kind of understanding of racism. So because I was looking and looking and looking and looking, I encountered a black man who was a guard at the Bureau of Engraving, and he still is, whose name is Neely Fuller. And this gentleman had been determined to find out what was happening to black people. And he said, what is going on is a global system of racism. More specifically, a global system of white supremacy. Meaning that the people in the world who classify themselves as white had evolved a system of oppression to hold down people who they classified as black, brown, red, and yellow. And I said to myself, this gentleman seems to have something. He went further to say that the system is operative in all areas of people activity. It is operative in economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. That not only was it operative every place on the planet Earth, that it was operative in all areas of people activity and that it was impossible to escape the impact since the system had come into being and had consolidated itself and that all people who were classified as non-whites were victims of this very powerful dynamic. And so I said, this is an absolutely fascinating statement. And I began to wonder, well, why would this happen? And let me say to all of these bright and handsome young men, that you remember this three-letter question. The question is why. When the question why something happens comes to your brain, always pay attention to it because that's a switch. If you say, I want to understand why, any problem that you face in life, if you say, I want to understand why this is a problem, then you are turning on a switch, just like a light switch, for your brain computer. You're saying, brain computer, go to work in my behalf. Bring me the information so I will understand what is happening in this world, because I intend to cause what I want to have happen, happen. But I have to know first what is going on now. So I raised the question in my brain computer, why? Why would this system of oppression, why would it have arisen in the first place? It did not always exist. All knowledgeable people know that the first people on the planet Earth were black people, people in Africa, the first civilization, the first physicians, the first philosophers, the first architects, the first engineers, the first mathematicians were black people. But something happened to that great and glorious civilization that existed thousands of years ago. So the fact that white supremacy as a dynamic or that the fact that racism came along and caused that to change, then I said, but why? What exactly was going on? So then I remembered things that I had learned in school and actually that I had read about that had not really connected up. I recall that even though black people, brown people, red people, yellow people are called minorities in this area of the world, meaning that we are lesser in number. But that if we look at the planet Earth, the black people, the brown people, the red people, the yellow people, 
people who are classified as non-white are the vast majority of people on this planet. That we had been deceived as to who our numbers or what our numbers were. That's why you look at the television about Panama today. And you see a few people who are quite jumping up and down and cheering. The majority of the people in Panama are black people. The majority of the people whose homes were bombed in Panama are black people. The majority of the people who were killed in Panama are black people. But if you look at television, and you would think, oh, the majority of the people in Panama are white. But the majority of people on this planet are black, brown, red, and yellow people. So I thought about that. And then I thought about experience in this area of the world that this was 20 years ago. We don't hear it overtly so much anymore, but we used to hear all the time black people are genetically inferior. All of the older people have heard that. How many of you younger people have heard people say things like that? Okay, tragically, some of you still hear it. But then I also thought about what I had learned in school and what I knew about that actually people who have the capacity to produce the pigment, the black pigment that makes our skin have color, that we are the genetically dominant people on the planet. And so then I said, oh my goodness, I understand why the black, brown, red, and yellow people have been oppressed. I said, oh, the black, brown, red, and yellow people have been oppressed because they are genetically dominant. And if they are not held down by the people, the tiny minority, less than one-tenth of the people on this planet whose skins are white, then the white population would be afraid that white genetic annihilation would take place. Now, some of you might say, I don't know what that lady is talking about. But you are young people now, and each and every one of you is going to graduate from elementary school, graduate from high school, and go to college, and go to the library. And this is an assignment from today. Go and read to understand what I'm talking about. What I'm saying very simply is if a black person and a white person had sexual intercourse, the baby would be colored. If a brown and a white person had sexual intercourse, the baby would be colored. If a so-called red person and a white person had a baby, the baby would be colored. And if a white person plus a yellow person had a baby, the baby would be colored. That means that the people who have the capacity to produce the pigment in our skin that is called black are genetically dominant. The people who lack that capacity, whose skins are white, even though they had taught all of the black, brown, red, and yellow people that they were supposed to be ugly because they had color, and taught them to say and to think before they learned how to read, if you are black, stay back. If you are brown, stick around. If you are yellow, you're mellow. And if you are white, you're right. How many of you young people have heard that? Now see, this is tragic that children would be learning it, but I said the war is going on. And the war has gone on for a very long time and the length of the war was re is related to the level of our understanding of exactly and specifically what the war is about. So that fact of genetic dominance, I concluded, and the numerical majority status of black, brown, red, and yellow people, I said, oh, this is the cause of racism. This is the cause of the oppression. This is the reason why many things look very horrible and tragic for people who are classified as non-white. Why, when they refer to the third world where the non-white people, the different parts of the world where the non-white people are supposed to be, why those areas of the world are filled with poverty, filled with ignorance, filled with health problems, 
and disease and not highly functional. That is a result of the war. Now, I'm not saying to you, and don't misunderstand me, I am not saying that the business of black, brown, red, and yellow people is to hate white people. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that the business of black, brown, red, and yellow people, and what must be a priority concern, is to understand why did people who classify themselves as white and classify all others as non-white, why they would move to dominate the world and cause impoverishment to all of the people who were classified as non-white. So I also said, well, gee, now that I understand that, the fear of genetic annihilation, that who would the system, this global system of racism, white supremacy, who would be the one group that would have to be attacked to make absolutely certain there was white genetic survival? That the attack would have to center on the black man, non-white people in general, male and female, but the attack would have to center on black men above all other non-white men. The reason being is that black people, male and female, have the highest genetic potential to cause white genetic annihilation. But men and women cannot cause white genetic annihilation equally. Women, whether they are white or black, cannot impose sexual intercourse. It is God-determined physiology that males, irrespective of color, can impose sexual intercourse. And so therefore, males, black males, of all of the non-white males would be looked at as the number one enemy the number one target of attack if there is going to be white genetic survival. Are you understanding me, audience? So once the black male was attacked, and I really like to take my understanding back far, we have been deceived in the system of white supremacy to think that Jesus was a white man. Jesus was a black man in Africa. How many of you young people knew that? Good, excellent. Jesus was a black man in Africa killed by white Roman soldiers. I come up further and think about the lynchings and the castrations that used to occur to African men who were brought to this area of the world in chains. Black men and women were brought to this area of the world. But it was black men under white supremacy who were lynched and castrated. And make no mistake, white supremacy was going on in Roman times. I bring it up further to the death of Malcolm X, a black man killed under white supremacy. On Monday, we are going to celebrate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King, another black male killed in the war of white supremacy. These are all, we can look upon them as martyrs in the war of white supremacy and the attack on black males that is a necessary and essential attack in that war. One can bring it up further and we say, well, why would they be blaming that black man in Boston? Why could somebody blame him and have a whole city go into agreement? Yes, that's the one to get. or the white woman who was raped in Central Park and to have a whole nation say, oh yes, it was those young black men who did it. 
And it was a lie because it was a white man who did it. Or to go to New Jersey and a prosecutor, white, knew that he could get away with saying a black man shot into his car. He knew that once the black man was blamed, everybody would go into agreement. Why? Because the black man is supposed to be the number one enemy and target of attack for the purpose of white genetic survival. But if we don't understand the war, then we'll just be saying, oh, they did it again. <laughs> Wonder why they would do that. Blaming the non-white male or the black male is why even somebody like Noriega in Panama, he didn't set himself up to sell drugs. White supremacy set him up to sell drugs. And then they went after him. We will not understand that dynamic unless we understand and are able to very specifically talk about this is an aspect of the war of white supremacy for the purpose of white genetic survival on planet Earth in the year 2000. Now, I am not justifying the selling of drugs, but all non-white people, that includes Mr. Noriega, it includes Mr. Colin Powell, and if you look at Colin Powell and you look at Noriega, they look like brothers. Don't misunderstand the meaning of that. That if we do not understand white supremacy, we will be confused about who's being used to do what, against whom. Mr. Colin Powell was used to kill large numbers of black people in Panama. Mr. Noriega was used to sell drugs or to be a conduit for drugs to go to non-white people in this war against black people and other non-white people for the purpose of white genetic survival. But in the course of that same war, the attack on black males comes in the form of underemployment and unemployment and black males not being able to find work. And when they cannot find work, they cannot play the role of husband. They cannot play the role of father. And they bring about the collapse, not they as black men, but white supremacy has set this chain of events up. Because white supremacy says, we are not going to live in fear of white genetic annihilation, and we're going to kill the people and destroy and inferiorize that particular group of people that make us feel so threatened. And that particular group is the black male, so that on January the 13th, 1990, we are holding a conference talking about endangerment. And other people hold conferences talking about the black male, the endangered species like they hold conferences on the elephant, the endangered species. Why? Because white people are seeing to it that African elephants are killed. So we want to understand exactly how this war brings about. And I say that the black family has been attacked, and it has been brought to a near point of destruction. We have to understand that to understand all of the fallout so that we see many, many children in foster care. Why? Because parents cannot take care of them economically. Many, many children in orphanages, many, many children in juvenile detention centers, and then instead of graduating from college, they graduate into the penitentiaries and into the prisons. And because of the stress of families not being able to function, mothers and fathers are depressed, and black people find themselves feeling so bad and not understanding why they're feeling bad, and because they are blamed instead of everybody saying, white supremacy is starting this problem. But the white supremacy state 
And the white supremacy culture keeps saying, no, you black people, you are the problem, you are the problem, the male is the problem, the female is the problem, the so-called black family is the problem. That's the same dynamic of blaming black people that is occurring in Boston. And so the black people are blamed and they feel stressed and they feel bad and then the same white supremacy system says if you're feeling bad, I put a dollar liquor store on that corner. And if you're feeling real bad, I put some cocaine and heroin and marijuana out here and crack and ice. I have manufactured this stuff for you because it's going to destroy your brain. I created it in a laboratory especially for you. I put it out here. I know you're feeling bad. I know daddy's not at home. I know mama doesn't understand. I know the teachers in school don't understand. You're feeling bad. I know you see uncle and brother standing on the corner unemployed. No car, no job, no clothes. Well, I'm going to set up a market over here that I know I can trap every single one of you in. And that market, I'm going to create it. I'm going to put the drugs there. I'm going to put the price on the drugs. I'm going to give you a gun to reinforce getting that price. Unbeknownst to you, I have set it all up. I want you dead. I want your brain cells killed. I do not want you in the colleges. I do not want you being fathers and families. I do not want you being the leaders of a community because this will challenge white genetic survival. Now, this is the war. And a question was raised about homosexuality and bisexuality. We have an epidemic of bisexuality and an epidemic of black male homosexuality because white supremacy has said, if I can create a dynamic wherein men are having sexual intercourse with one another, what? I don't have to worry about white genetic survival. So I can create that. I can produce that very behavior. I can produce that behavior by taking fathers out of the home. I can create that behavior by making fathers passive. And making fathers passive is because the war of white supremacy has been won over us. See, it's just like playing football. It's just like playing basketball. When your team has lost, you better know it. If your team has lost the tournament, you can't go back in the squad room and say, my team has won. If the team has lost, you've got to go back in the squad room, put all the plays on the blackboard, run the cameras back and forward, bring it to a stop. What play did they make and what play did we not have the counterplay to go with? How much did they understand about offense and defense that we failed to understand when we were trying to structure defense and offense? We cannot say we lost, did not lose the tournament and we're the greatest players on the field. Now what I can say is that we are God's chosen people. We were chosen to be the first people on the planet. We were chosen to be the first people who established family life. We were chosen to be the first people who established civilization and arts and science and engineering. But in the course of cosmic dynamic, the people who were first were brought low. And God said, I made you first. I made you out of all substance. Out of you have come all of the people on this planet. Now I have brought you down, and the challenge is to see, can you rise up again to your glory? But white supremacy and evil has brought us down. And let us understand that we are down. And it's going to be up to all of us and up to all of these young people to see that the black team 
is going to rise to its heights again. The black team is not going to be chumped because they don't understand what is going on. It is up to every single one of us. There's an African proverb that says two African proverbs. The first is when the fool learns the game, it's over. The second African proverb is, each one teach one. It is up to us. I don't know whether they do a dance here in Baltimore called the electric slide. OK. Now, people will say, well, Dr. Welsing, how are people going to understand what you're talking about? How do people learn how to do the electric slide? Because he who knows teaches. Each one teaches one. So in the same way, we can help each other understand what the war of white supremacy is all about. So no black person on this planet, and certainly in this area of the world, will be ever again saying, what's happening? The only thing we will be saying is, we do know what's going on, and I'll see you in the library. You do know what's going on, so we will see each other in the classrooms. We do know what's going on, so we will be serious. And somebody will say, well, when was the last time you saw any black people dancing? Well, they can dance. They're the best dancers on the planet. But during war, the people have to put the records aside and get down into the business of war and studying war so that there can be justice and peace. But let me go back to homosexuality. If you take fathers out of families, male children will experience male hunger. But because males are socialized to cover up your feelings, don't talk about what hurts. Little male children are almost socialized to say, I don't want my daddy. I haven't seen him. It doesn't make any difference. Well, it does make a difference. Male children need their fathers. They need their fathers to hold their hands, to walk with them. You may have some museum area here in Baltimore. Go and look on Saturday. You probably will see white males holding the hands of little three-year-old black white adult males holding the hands of little three-year-old white males. And in that hand-holding process, male strength is passing out of the arm of the father into the hand of the little boy. And he begins to understand male strength. White supremacy also produces teenage pregnancy. So if a 14-year-old mother is holding a little baby, and then later on you wonder, why is the little baby boy's hand weak? Because it was a weak hand that held him, not the arm of a man. <laughs> the teenage mother is not bad. The father is not bad. We are all victims of this war. And to the extent that we don't understand the war or understand what it is, we will continue to be victimized by it. So the male child is hungering for father and hungering for father, and it's a whole lot of other male children on the block, hungering for father, and hungering for father. And I'm going to be real plain. And then there's some older males who hungered for father, and hungered for father. And that hungering for father translates in the brain computer, I need some male substance. Well, where do I get male substance from symbolically? Somebody will say, well, then suck my penis. And that goes into the mouth. And that is the top end of the gastrointestinal tract through which the body is fed. Or put your penis in my bottom, in my anus. That's the other end of the gastrointestinal tract. So semen is going into either end of the gastrointestinal tract. 
because the person is experiencing subconsciously male hunger. Do you understand what I'm saying? It is also because we are in the context of the white supremacy culture and the white supremacy culture, the dominant form of sexual expression in Greece and Rome was male homosexuality. Do you understand me? The reason that that was the dominant form of sexual intercourse is because we ought to have a gigantic world map so you can see the colossus of the continent of Africa and then see those little tiny countries of Europe sitting atop the colossus of Africa. So then you see that boot of Rome, Italy and Rome, and the islands of Greece. And so when those pale men looked over that Mediterranean and saw those great, big, tall black men, they went into a profound sense of male inadequacy. And that sense of male inadequacy caused them to think, put your penis in my mouth, or put your penis in my anus, or let me do it to you. Are you with me? Why? Because those big, tall black men in Africa could cause white genetic annihilation 35,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, up to the very moment that we are speaking. And this is why, in this same white supremacy system and culture, updated, ball games are the major focus of attention. What are the balls? What are the balls in a culture that says, keep your eye on the ball? the same balls that were cut off when black men were lynched and castrated. The balls contain the genetic material. And so a culture has evolved where ball games are the most dominant expression about the most fundamental concern of white supremacy. That's why most people don't realize they're looking at it all the time. But there are two series of ball games in the white supremacy system and culture. The two series of ball games are big brown balls and small white balls. The big brown balls are played by the men in the culture that are considered to be most virile. because they represent the men that are on this planet considered to be the standard of manhood, the fathers of all of the people on the planet, and that is the black man. Now, just like there are two series of ball games and you bring to mind in your visualization and in your imagination the male genitalia, and the male genitalia and the black male genitalia is what comes to mind in the white supremacy system every time a black man is attacked. Because it is looked upon his genitals and the powerful black genetic material is perceived as a weapon. The weapon that can cause white genetic annihilation or that can threaten white genetic survival, which is why the Republican Party could say, Willie Horton, a black man who was released from prison and raped a white female and win an election. So just like there, if you're looking at the male genitalia and we're serious because we are soldiers about to win a war, so we're not plain about thinking about male genitalia, you see one testicle, a phallus or a penis, and another testicle. So the concern about the balls is played out in ball games. The concern about the phallus is played out in smoking objects. 
because just like their two series of ball games, big brown and small white, smoking objects are substitutes for the phallus or the penis, and their two series of smoking objects, whether you've thought about it or not, and maybe this will help you not smoke, <laughs> are big brown and small white. The most intelligent men smoke big brown smoking objects. I mean, this is a symbolism that is used in the culture. And what is that? No, I said the most intelligent. Pipes. The most powerful smoke what? Cigars. And then they say Moors taste better. But cigarettes, the small white smoking objects in the same culture are called what, ladies and gentlemen? Fags. If you don't believe it, look in your dictionary. Fag is a word, children, for homosexuality. Am I creating the culture, or am I simply reading it? What does a white female say is her ideal mate at the time that she's yelling, wait, wait, he raped me and it was black. Who does she say is her ideal mate? Tall, dark, and handsome. Yet she accuses the black male of wanting to rape her. Valentine's Day is coming up, the middle of February. What is it that the white female wants to receive from her white mate? Chocolate candy. And I won't add with nuts. <laughs> now this is the symbolism. What am I doing? I'm trying to pull out all of the symbolism that is underneath the surface of this surface phenomenon where we're walking around talking about what's happening. And we don't know why the men are dying. The men are dying because genocide is an imperative aspect of white supremacy. When it really begins to get shaken, it kills the black men so that there will be fewer people to threaten white genetic annihilation. And we are living in the midst of mass death right now. Mass death caused by drugs, chemical warfare weapons, deaths caused by AIDS, biological warfare weapons. Oh, we don't know where AIDS came from. Again, blaming the black man. Oh, it came from Africa. No, it came from a white supremacist in a laboratory who said, this is the way we can get rid of a lot of these people. We can kill 50 million of them in Africa alone. And since we have accustomed them to death, we gave them 22 dead black male children in Atlanta and made them go into the church and pray about it. We killed a 1,000 of them at Jonestown and made them say it was a church or some kind of cult retreat. 5,000 dead black men in that so-called commune in Oregon, picked up off of the streets of every major city. So when the men never came back and we didn't understand what white supremacy was, we just kept doing the electric slide and kept stepping. All of that was warfare of white supremacy against black people for the purpose of white genetic survival on the part of a tiny white minority on this planet that is genetic recessive to all of the black, brown, red, and yellow people. So I'm saying this is what we must understand this is what we must work with. All those black men being dead are soldiers or martyrs in that war. The way we stop it is to understand the game. I say that we need to look at white supremacy the same way that we look at a chessboard. 
You may not ever play chess, but I encourage each and every one of you to understand what the game of chess is all about. The game of chess is an old game. But since white supremacy decided to get highly involved in it, let's go back a hundred years, they always, they, they determined that the side of the chessboard that would always move first is the white side of the chessboard. So that white would be playing offense, defense, which is the white supremacy attack against black. And that the black side of the chessboard would play defense, offense, trying to catch up. Now, some people say, well, I know how we can deal with that. We can make black move first and fool ourselves. No, you learn about chess with white moving first because we are under the offensive tack of white supremacy. We must master winning chess from the black side of the chessboard, which is defense offense. Beyond that, what is chess about? The most fundamental thing about chess is that it is a game wherein one king checkmates the other king. The white king is moving against the black king on the chessboard. That is the attack on the black male in the society of white supremacy. So anytime anybody says what's happening, the first thing should come to your mind is that chessboard. Just like in football and basketball under white supremacy and all these other team sports, the home team puts on white. Is that correct? And the outside team puts on color. That means home is white. That's just like all of the white people coming together and talking about a common European homeland. Are you all with me? The current chess champion, a Russian, says that chess is the most deadly game there is because it is a game about the tactics and strategy of war. So each and every one of us, we should stop thinking this is some kind of rainbow ring around the rosy picnic. This is white supremacy in its deadly attack on us. Now, there are a lot of people who have gone around and talked about the Holocaust. Six million Semites of the Jewish religion were killed in Germany and other parts of Europe between 1933 and 1945. People talk about the Holocaust this and the Holocaust that. And every time you turn on the television, it's something about the Holocaust. But they lie about it. What is the lie? That Hitler said, I'm doing it because you are not white. Now, nobody talks about that. Hitler said, I'm killing you because you are not white. I don't care that you've got light. Your ancestry was on the continent of Africa. You may have miscegenated for 2,000 years and gotten lighter. But I want to know who your great-grandmother was. And if you were tied to people from Africa, that's why you're going to be killed. Now I say, we need to make that an object lesson. Because people who had gotten very light-skinned after miscegenating in Europe, white supremacy still came along and sought them out and said, you're going to go to a concentration camp and you're going to be killed. Now, if you don't understand that, like there's an English-American philosopher, George Santayana, who said, those who don't learn from history will repeat it. On top of the bodies in Jonestown was a big sign for some reason. Those who don't learn from history will repeat it. So I'm saying study that war, just like there was a black lady in the state of Louisiana who through miscegenation became so light-skinned, she said, for all practical purposes, I'm white. So I want reclassification. She went to a court, and what did the judge tell her a few years ago? You cannot be reclassified. You are non-white. 
You are carrying genetic material. The judge didn't go further to say this. You see, but let's say, just looking at the surface, why couldn't she be white? Because the fundamental fear is white genetic annihilation. And if white genetic annihilation is the fundamental concern, then anybody who might be bringing genes, the powerful genes from Africa that could cause white genetic annihilation, that those are the people who have to be pinpointed as the enemy. Now I say, young men, all of you, I want you to understand what this war is about. And you become some of the most serious people, not hostile, not mean, not discourteous, not cursing, not swearing, but some of the most serious people this planet has ever seen. And they'll be looking at you saying, well, well look, at those, look at those black little boys. They're not clowning on the corner. They're not fighting each other. They're not cursing one another. They've got books in their arms, not boom boxes on their shoulders, blasting their brains out. They'll say, uh-oh, we don't know what to do. But you all keep marching. Keep marching and being serious. And I would suggest call yourselves soldiers of justice. See, Martin Luther King said he was a drum major for justice. That he, if you think about his life on Monday, you say that was one of our soldiers. And one of our soldiers who conducted a very, very important experiment. He said, I think if everybody learns how to love, we can beat this thing. Nonviolence and love. And what happened? They killed that science and soldier. They killed him because if everybody started to love, then there would be what? White genetic annihilation. So he had to go. Soldier Malcolm said, I think maybe the bullet. Well, you know he had to go. So we are learning from the lessons that all of these soldiers taught. And we are going to learn how to be serious because we have to solve the problem on the black side of the chessboard. If you're playing the black side of the chessboard, you don't ask the white side, let me make some points or help me. If you're wearing the colored jersey on the football field, you can't ask the people in the white jerseys to help you make some points. If you're on the basketball court and wearing the colored jerseys, you can't ask the white people in the jerseys or the people who are wearing the white jerseys, give me some points. Help me out. They will take you to the nearest mental hospital or take you off the field. This is a process that we are going to have to master all by ourselves. And God said, I gave you all of the equipment that any brain power that any group of people have on this planet, they got it from their mothers and fathers, and their mothers and fathers were black. Did you all hear me? If you look at any people on the planet, you can look at the Japanese. You can select any people that you say, well, they're smart, and they may well be smart, as we're sitting looking pitiful. But realize that no new genetic material has been created. All the genetic material that any group of people has ever been able to use came from Africa and came from the black mothers and fathers. So don't doubt that your brains won't work. Your brains will work. Your brains are as good as any brains on this planet but you have to give your brain an assignment. You have to be ready to look at reality because the brain computer will say, well, I'm pointing out reality, but they won't accept it, so the brain computer just to save fuel cuts off. If a black person is walking around and say, I don't see any racism, it's no racism where I am, then their brain computer shuts off because they are rejecting the data that is coming in to the computer.
So I'm saying that we are going to end the endangerment of black people by ending the endangerment of black males through our understanding. And since the war is on, I'm saying this, that we have to get into quality control, black child production and development. Quality control, black child production and development. Now somebody will say, well, what is responsible for the Japanese economic miracle? The one thing that the Japanese themselves credit with their recent economic miracle is that a man named Deming, and he did happen to be white, he had an idea about quality control. Don't make just any old product. Determine that it is going to always be of high quality. So the people over here, the industrialists over here, didn't like the idea, didn't want to go for it. The Japanese-speaking non-white people said, well, we're going to get into quality control. Explain that to us. And so they got into the business of turning out everything that they turned out was first rate. Now, we don't have industrial factories right now, but we do have genitals, and we do produce children. Now, what if we said every child that we produce is going to develop to the highest quality? They're going to be second to none on this planet. We're not going to have any black male children in prison. We're only going to have them in colleges and universities, making this entire planet a better place to live. So what do we have to do to bring about quality control? Everybody go home, and in the quiet of your bathroom or bedroom, you take all your clothes off, and you look in that mirror. And you look at your genitals, meaning your reproduction unit. Now you look at that and you say, now I am only going to use this for quality control production. <laughs> because what are we being told now? Oh, the little babies with AIDS are just draining the budget and so the city can't pay for housing because it has to pay for all the AIDS babies. Oh, all the little crack babies whose parents can't take care of them, and all the little teenagers who are and we don't have enough people to take care of them, and everybody should just get busy taking care of all the little crack babies and the little aid babies and all the little foster babies. Cut that out. That is not quality control. Now, I'm not saying anybody is bad because white supremacy produces sex obsession. Did you hear what I said? White supremacy produces sex obsession. Sex obsession develops when children do not get enough lap time. That means time as little babies and little children to sit calmly on mother's lap and have mother, and Dr. Ackland Lynch was talking about father singing as mother's holding. If little children don't get that time where people are patiently holding them and comforting them, not get off my lap, boy, you too big, he's three. Girl, get down, stop bothering me, she's two. You know, that's the confusion and the chaos that has been brought about under white supremacy. You see, where mothers and fathers don't function, children get into dependency, emotional deprivation, and dependency deprivation, and then they start having sex prematurely, and little girl says, I want to have your baby. If you love me, you have my baby. That's white supremacy conditioned thinking. The thinking that is in the oppressive dynamic that is making us in a state of total confusion, it is an aspect of the war. Now, I am recommending as one way to help fight this war 
and we have to fight the war in economics. We have to fight it on nine fronts at the same time. We have to fight it in economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. And so in the area of sex and reproduction, sex is not an activity for children. Do not feel bad if you engage in sex. You are not bad. But learn that that is inappropriate activity for children. What is appropriate activity for children? Learning and studying and going to the library and becoming some kind of Olympic star specialist. And learning seven skills. Not reproducing. Just like random reproduction on the part of older people. That came about, what did they do with us in the slavery phase of white supremacy? Say, Hattie, I want you to produce me another buck. You're going to get an extra piece of fat back if you make a baby. Because I need another worker on this plantation. That's updated welfare system. Hattie, each time you have another baby, I'm going to give you a little bit more on that welfare check. Now, it's not going to be enough to send him to college. I don't intend for him or her to go to college. They're just going to be the inferiorized people that I keep looking at and say, look at them. Look at that mess. And look at me. I'm white and superior. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we know that's the move that's coming from the white side of the chessboard. That's white supremacy. Producing black inferiorization. So we say, no, we're going to mastermind that. See, a top government official, for you young people, if you didn't know it, a top government official, white, said, all black people want is tight pussy, loose shoes, and a warm place to piss. That's what a government official said about us. Why? Because they had produced the conditions for sex obsession. They knew what they could get us to do. Just like the people who said, yeah, now we put them in this state. Now we want to get rid of a lot of them because they're not doing too much thinking. We will put a sexually transmitted virus out there. And they'll be saying, I don't care if I get AIDS. I just got to have some. So they said, we can kill a whole lot of them that way. Do you understand what I'm saying? So how do we outsmart it? We say, well, we know this is what you've done. We understand the plays that you're making on your side of the field. We understand the plays that you're making on your side of the chessboard. But watch our discipline. Watch what we are going to learn how to do. And I say that if we want to produce quality control soldiers, no black woman has a baby before 30, and no black male becomes a father before 35. Now what? That means that that male and female soldier, under the conditions of the war of white supremacy, said, I first must master self-discipline and self-sufficiency. So I have to learn how to work and support myself. If somebody deprives me of a job, then they're going to be in trouble. Because I'm going to demand a job. The people in Eastern Europe are demanding that they have jobs. They're not going to get welfare. Those white men over there said, we have to have jobs. Now, you can give welfare to these non-white people, but you're going to give us jobs because a man has to work to support himself, his wife, and his family. So don't let anybody give you any lesser conditions. If you say, well, you're not going to have a job, then you say, well, you're waging total war against me in the labor area of economics and labor. And I'm not going to sit still and allow that to happen to me. So I'm saying in the meantime, what do we do between 0 and 30 and 0 and 35? We're going to school. And we're learning skills. And we're learning how to have all of the wherewithal to be self-sufficient and to wage war against white supremacy. Every older black person 
your conversation and dialogue with younger black people and younger black males is what are you going to do when you grow up? If the child doesn't know, then you give the child a suggestion as the maximum that he or she can attain. Not just, well, that's okay, you don't have to do nothing, your dad didn't do, no, 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 no. Say, we are in a war, we intend to win this war, I have no doubt that we're gonna win the war, but we have to make the best plays. Nobody in basketball makes superior tactics and strategy than black men. Nobody in football makes superior tactics and strategy than black men. The first general that everybody studied is Hannibal. Not that he was the first, but he is the best that everybody still studies. The first chess champion in this area of the world was a black man. He was light enough so that they could slide him over and not call him black, but he was black. So I want to encourage us we will end this endangerment by understanding the nature of the war that we are facing. If we do not face up to reality and learn how to talk about white supremacy, even if some white person says, well, you're talking about white supremacy, what are you gonna do about it? Well, we're afraid to do anything about it right now, but we're gonna talk about it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not pretend that it doesn't exist. It's nothing wrong with saying, well, we're afraid right now to do anything about it, if that is the fact. But we are going to look at it and study it and learn exactly what it is, and we are going to overcome. We are not going to have the endangerment of non-white people, and we are not going to have the endangerment of black males because that's genocide. We are going to win this war, forward people. That's the end. <laughs>
Do you see what I'm saying? A child can't hold a baby as long as it needs to be held for the little baby to say, okay, let me die. I'm ready to go. <laughs> you see, you have to be mature in holding that baby and holding that baby and loving that baby and telling that baby that it's wonderful and that you are there to protect and support it. Then the baby can go forward. And as you say, everybody becomes a self-sufficient, productive unit. You see, and as I'm saying, a self-sufficient, productive soldier to really play their part in this war to bring about justice. Thank you, Akron. Yes. Real loud, I can't hear you say. A lot of black quarterbacks that, that, have, that have come out of college and in college now, they find a lot of ways to just put them right. they're smart enough and they're just athletic. Mm -hmm. Then, I watch the Philadelphia Eagles and the Spoilers, maybe it's just me. I, just, I see a lot, of, a lot of things happening in the football game. It's always holding those teams back. I grew up with the Philadelphia Eagles and the Spoilers. They had black quarterbacks? No, that's a, see, that's a very good point. So you won't sit in front of the television and throw your shoe at it again. You just say, oh, I understand. This television is in the framework of the system of white supremacy. I cannot play up those black Hannibals that are going down that, you know, playing the role of the quarterback. But what we have to understand is to not sit there and say, well, I guess I am dumb. No, say this is what white supremacy has to do. I am going forward to quarterback bringing justice to this planet and to black people. You see, but you're absolutely right. It's just like if you look at television, you will see black men being paid to be in a lot of giddy roles and making a lot of giddy faces. Like there's an ad, I think it's about cough syrup or something and the black man is like, my grandmother, my mommy, <laughs> my mama didn't. You're not going to see any white man talking like that. You see, but it's reducing the black man talking about a grown man, a big style grown man talking about my mommy. A big style grown man talking about my mommy. A big style grown man talking about my mommy. A big style grown man talking about my mommy. A big style grown man talking about my mommy. Now, as long as we are victims of white supremacy and pretending that everything is cool, Now, as long as we are victims of white supremacy and pretending that everything is cool. Now, as long as we are victims of white supremacy and pretending that everything is cool. Now, as long as we are victims of white supremacy and pretending that everything is cool, then the brain computer has to go subconsciously and produce the data, you see. Now, as long as we are victims of white supremacy and pretending that everything is cool, then the brain computer has to go subconsciously and produce the data, you see. Now, as long as we are victims of white supremacy and pretending that everything is cool, then the brain computer has to go subconsciously and produce the data, you see. Now, as long as we are victims of white supremacy and pretending that everything is cool, then the brain computer has to go subconsciously and produce the data, you see. 